thank you so much for coming uh, to uh, today's lunch seminar. It's always great to see many people and I'm especially happy, A, that we are in the cinema room because I think it's a really, really nice room. But more importantly, B, we have a fantastic speaker today with Tim van Emmerich from the Wageningen University who will talk about a plastic debris in rivers. Tim currently holds a, and I have to look that up, assistant professor in hydrologic sensing um, and is uh, working with the Department of Hydrology and Quantitative Water Management. It's a long title. Yeah. <laughs> um, we like long in the Netherlands. Huh? Wow. <laughs> I'm not sure how to progress from there. Um, the only thing I remember reading about you is that you actually love pasta. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> Had it yesterday. <laughs> Lucky also, you. Yeah. I love pasta myself. But today we talk about plastic, not pasta. Yeah. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh Yeah, we can talk about pasta later. That's fine. Uh, happy to do so. Um, is this on? Can I start? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Yeah. Well, first of all, Raoul and Marianne and also Bert, I'm sure Bert is here, but thank you very much for having me today. Um, it's really it's really great to be here and also really great to be in Norway again after almost 11 years of absence. Um, so that's quite nice. Today I would like to talk to you about plastic debris in rivers uh, because that is what I'm working on and have been working on in the past years. And um, as, I, as, I, as I've learned, I also uh, know that Niva is interested in, uh, in plastic in rivers and, uh, and and other aquatic ecosystems. So, um, is there who's, who of you is working with with plastics at the moment or has worked with plastics? Ah, great. Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah. So if I make any mistakes, just correct me. That's fine. Um, yeah. So as Raoul um, uh, just said, I work at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, who has heard of Wageningen before? Okay, for those who haven't heard of Wageningen, it's okay. It's just the best university in the Netherlands. Uh, it's right in the middle. Um, but it's, uh, it's difficult to reach there. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, let me know if you're around because uh, it's a beautiful campus there. Um, before joining the Wageningen University this summer, I also worked at the Ocean Cleanup for um, one and a half years, where I basically started working on plastics for the first time. Um, before that, I got my degrees at Delft University in technology, in civil engineering, and, uh, and hydrology. Uh, and uh, that's sort of what got me rolling in the field of hydrologic sensing and measuring various components of the water cycle. Um, I've always done that to try to contribute to um, answering society's grand challenges. Um, and I think plastic debris in rivers is one of the most urgent challenges we're facing right now, especially as scientists. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, we're going to start with the question if plastic is actually a problem or not. Uh, maybe half of the room here and more is already convinced it is a problem, but I think it's always good to just keep this in mind and uh, assess, assess if it's really a, a problem or not. Um, after we're going to quickly define plastic debris because there's many definitions of plastics and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Um, we're going to talk about origin and fate of plastic debris in rivers. Um, we're going to elaborate a little bit more on how to actually quantify plastic debris in rivers. And finally, I'll just give my thoughts on what I think is uh, necessary in future research. So starting with the plastic problem, um, who is convinced that plastics in aquatic ecosystems is a problem? Is there someone who is doubting it? <laughs> oh, just one? Okay. <laughs> That's fine, because actually, um, Microplastic research, I think most of the people who work with plastics at Niva work with microplastics. And I think it's uh, I think it's extremely sad that no matter where you go, you find them, right? You find them in the trenches, you find them on the glaciers, you find them in human stool, you find them in basically yeah, most of the of the fauna that you um, that you that you find in aquatic ecosystems. Um, but I have to say I'm I'm not really sure what the how big of a problem it really is. Um, Sure, there is a lot of negative effects associated with microplastics, uh, and luckily there's a lot of research going on on further exploring the, the, the potential hazards it has on human life and other um, forms of life, of course. Um, but I really think that one of the, in a way, sort of low-hanging fruit is actually the, the macroplastics. 
and unfortunately we know so little about the microplastics but we know that it is a problem right no matter where you go if you you can you can go to to a random park in oslo or somewhere in india if you see that plastics are everywhere so it's it's just uh, immoral already yeah right to make such a mess out of our planet but it also impacts aquatic life uh, just to illustrate all these all these pieces of plastic are being ingested Animals are being entangled, and uh, well, I don't think there is a day that we don't read about uh, more whales and seals being killed by, by plastic pollution. And these are, in general, the larger pieces of plastics, unfortunately. Um, besides impacts on aquatic life, there's also a lot of economic damage that is imposed by uh, especially the larger plastic uh, pollution because of uh, damages to vessels. Um, losses in economic and fishing activities, and of course, all these polluted beaches, for example, in Indonesia, where the governments, people spend a lot of time and money on cleaning it to, to make sure that the tourists keep on coming. And finally, as an example, increased flood risks, um, as we see that actually in dense urban areas, especially in Southeast Asia, microplastic pollution blocks and clocks urban hydrologic and hydraulic infrastructure and thereby actually increasing the flood risk in areas that are already sort of flood prone and uh, where people are not really equipped to deal with such uh, problems. So to conclude, yes, plastic uh, is a big problem. And in my, in my view, especially the microplastics is a problem. And that is also because we know actually quite little about it. Uh, just to make sure that we that we talk about the same things or that we are on the same page, um, there's many definitions of plastics and there's many different ways to classify them or categorize them in terms of sizes. Uh, but these are sort of the four most common definitions of plastics, ranging from the nanoplastics, which are really small, to the infamous microplastics, um, up to, let's say, five millimeter in size. Above that, the, uh, the, the mesoplastics, uh, which are the plastics you can sort of still easy, easily see by, uh, by, uh, by eye. And then the macroplastics, uh, which are, let's say, all the plastics larger than five centimeters, um, which makes them quite easy to detect by human eye again. And if I if I talk or if you talk about plastic debris, you mainly talk about the um, the uh, the two largest size classes. So everything larger than than the mesoplastics and macroplastics. So let's say everything larger than five millimeters is what I consider plastic debris. Uh, of course, this is not the absolute truth, uh, but everyone who's working in plastic just make sure that you define it well, because uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to interpret results if we don't know uh, which of the plastic type we're, uh, we're talking about. Now, besides the size classes, there's also, there's, there, uh, I mean, there's, there's so many different kinds of plastics nowadays on the market, and they're, they're all, I mean, they're there for a reason, right? They're there to, uh, to make sure that we, that we can keep our food fresh, that we uh, save energy on transport, that we have lasting durable materials, and for all these different purposes, different specific kinds of plastics have, have been optimized. And um, as you can see, all of the plastic things that you normally encounter in life, they're all made of different materials, which also makes it quite difficult to study this, of course. Um, if we talk about plastics <laughs> in rivers, there's a couple of plastic types that, uh, that I would say occur the most. Um, and I guess these are also the, the usual suspects. Um, so if you just quickly sort of see where they what we find in typical typical river systems, uh, we can find, for example, oh, there's no mouse here. We can, for example, find the plastic bags hanging in trees after floods or in the riparian vegetation. We see floating, expanded polystyrene um, food boxes, for example. We see suspended plastics, we could either be, which could either be uh, PET bottles with some um, water inside or plastic bags. We see specific types of plastics um, in biota, and we see the, let's say, the, the higher density plastics um, on the bed or actually in the sediments. And this is also why, why, why the, I guess the science of plastics in general is so difficult, because there are so many different kinds of plastics, they, they all have their own story. And if we really want to understand and, and um, optimize strategies to reduce plastic pollution of aquatic ecosystems, we have to understand where all these different kinds of plastics, where they come from, where they go, and how they transport through, for example, a river system. Which brings me to the origin and fate of plastics. Um, it's, uh, it sounds very easy, but uh, the longer you, you study this, the, the, yeah, the, the more you see that's actually quite complex. Most of the, most of the sources and things are, are quite easy to understand, or at least they're, they're easy to, 
to think of yourselves. Uh, because I mean, where do plastics really come from, right? It's yeah, it feels quite obvious. It's people who just throw it away, or it's uh, it's mismanaged plastic waste, lacking infrastructure. It's um, industry where plastics may leak into the environment, uh, etc. Um, and there's of course different ways of uh, of transportation depending on where it comes from. So. Given that you dispose your plastic bag on the street or on a park, um, transfer mechanisms like wind speed or surface runoff or other kinds of hydrometeorological processes might actually transport all these plastics through the catchment into river systems. And then in, in the river system, there's again all these things that might that may happen to uh, to plastics. Uh, this was one of the first people who described this. Uh, was um, it was a, it was done by a paper by Williams and Simmons. Uh, more than 20 years ago, who called it the so-called Christmas tree effect, because they saw that all these plastic bags and hygienic products that they end up in rivers for some magic re reason, and then quite easily got accumulated in riparian vegetation, as you can see here. And once they're there, it becomes quite difficult for these plastics to get remobilized again. Uh, they may, might get remobilized through floods, or they might just wait there and degrade uh, into microplastics before they are transported out of the system. Um, but there's also different kinds of sources. So we're now talking about sort of the, uh, let's call it the unintentional ways of plastic uh, pollution, right? Uh, maybe like an infrastructure, uh, maybe an extreme event, uh, flooding, for example. But unfortunately, there's also sources like these where waste infrastructure actually exists of dumping plastic waste intentionally into river systems because river systems just get rid of them, right? I mean, if you live here, you throw it in river and it's gone. That's sort of how we used to treat our rivers in Western Europe as well uh, until let's say 20, 30 years ago. And this is unfortunately what you see everywhere. <coughs> and again, because the human factor is so important and maybe governing, it also makes it quite difficult to, to really study this uh, as a geoscientist. So the question is, how do we quantify plastic uh, debris in rivers? Um, I'm gonna, Talk a little bit about the two ways that uh, that 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 we use, or that that uh, that I have been using, to quantify plastics in river in river systems. Which is on the one hand modeling. We're a geoscientist. We like to model, and at the same time we do observations because we're geoscientists and we like to do observations. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, modeling strategies to quantify uh, plastic uh, debris in rivers, uh, but I will mainly focus in the remainder of my talk on observations and how to actually measure plastics in, uh, in river systems. Um, is anyone familiar with the Jambeck et al. paper uh, in Science in 2015? Maybe hands up if you read the paper. Yeah. So just as a recap, this is really one of the, the, the key papers uh, and one of the first papers to sort of globally assess and estimate how much plastics are being emitted from the land into the ocean. Uh, and I think the, the figure that they arrived at was around 10 million tons of plastic waste entering the oceans every year from, um, from land-based sources. Now, after that paper, um, uh, there, there have been a couple of efforts to, to specify this a little bit more. So in, in, the, in the first effort, it was really sort of a, um, an, a lumped approach where on country level, it was estimated how much plastics is leaking into the environment and makes it into the ocean eventually. Um, but we, we had the hunch, or there was this hunch that rivers might play a, a governing role in actually conveying the plastics from land into the ocean. So most plastic, uh, let's say riverine plastic models, they consist of three parts, which is an estimation of the mismanaged plastic waste on land, uh, which is basically the lumped estimation of all the plastics that is not being treated. So either it's not being uh, taken into, it's not, it's not even entering some sort of waste management infrastructure, but it also might be that in the waste infrastructure itself, there is leaking of the plastic waste into the natural environment. Um, based on those estimations, you can design your model, and that predicts how much of this plastics is, in the end, emitted into the ocean. And just to illustrate this, uh, a recent paper by Le Beton and Andrade um, made a, a, a revised estimation of how much mismanaged plastic waste um, there actually is on, 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 on Earth and around the globe. And they, uh, they arrived at, the, I think it's a one by one kilometer um, data set of 
how much plastic waste and tons per year there is being mismanaged all around the globe. And there is two models uh, developed by Le Beton et al. and Schmidt et al. that uh, coincidentally um, were published in the same year. Uh, and they didn't do it, uh, they, they were not in contact, which I actually find quite surprising. But the very, they had a very similar approach. So they used a, a, comp, a sort of catchment lumped approach where they said, well, we have this estimation of mismanaged plastic waste in a catchment. We know that a catchment has a certain amount of runoff. Uh, then we have one or two uh, magic parameters, and that brings us to an estimation of how much plastic is being emitted from rivers around the world. Um, and of course, there's many, many aspects that we can improve. Uh, it's catchment lumped. It doesn't really take into account temporal or spatial variations. But at least these models gave us a first um, estimation of how riverine plastic emission is distributed over the world and uh, very clearly gave us some uh, yeah, some ideas of where to find the hotspots of marine um, or of plastic, uh, river plastic emission into the ocean. Of course, this is all very lumped, as I just said, and uh, I think it's our task as geoscientists, or at least it's my personal ambition to try to, to make this more accurate, because we don't want to know only how much plastic there's being emitted on an average year, right? We want to know how it varies over time and how it uh, varies over space, how it varies over the cross section or over the river length. Because if you know these things, if you know how it varies over time and space, you can actually act on it and you can optimize your prevention or, or reduction or, or cleaning activities. Which is what brings me to how we observe plastic uh, in river systems. Um, I'll firstly briefly touch upon the, let's say, the four categories of uh, plastic observations. And after that, I will give some concrete examples of uh, some work that we did in the last couple of years. So if we think about how to measure plastics in rivers and specifically plastic debris, so the larger pieces of plastics, there is basically one method that everyone suggests uh, and have and actually also implements, which is what I, what I call the active sampling, which is uh, can be quite simple and it can just be going with a net to a river and you stick your net in a river and you wait and you see what you get out of it. And by that, you can sort of calculate uh, plastic concentrations. You can analyze the type of composition, et cetera. But as you can already see, it, uh, it might be quite um, labor intensive. As for especially the larger rivers, you might need additional infrastructure, infrastructure like boats um, and, uh, and cranes, et cetera. And of course, you need some place to stand on. So you're limited to the availability of bridges. Another intuitive method, I would say, is uh, so-called uh, tracking of plastic items. So you can do this in various ways. Uh, you can or spray paint plastic items or uh, label them, uh, with, which I think is a little bit more environmentally uh, friendly. Uh, but what you basically do is you release intentionally um, items into your river system and you just track them over time and you see where they accumulate and how fast they go through your river system. Um, and of course, this is quite nice, uh, and it can really give some insights on how travel or how plastic pollution travels through a river system. Um, most of the studies that I've seen so far concluded that they basically lost all of the tracked particles. Uh, so yeah, that on the one hand uh, shows how difficult this problem is, but also uh, makes it or shows that this is maybe not the most ideal way of uh, um, observing plastic pollution in rivers. Third method is uh, what I call passive sampling. Uh, luckily, around the world, there, there's already so many efforts to reduce plastic pollution in rivers. Um, this is an example from the River Seine in, in France, where Casperi um, et al. used the, the garbage collected at these, uh, at these um, um, yeah, this cleanup infrastructure to further analyze what kind of debris um, is actually flowing through the River Seine. So what is, for example, the relation between organic or the ratio between organic and plastic debris, what kind of plastic debris do we find typically, et cetera, and can we sort of, um, uh, can we say something about where it, uh, where it comes from, et cetera. Of course, this is quite nice if you have nothing and you don't have to, you don't have, to have specific clima, cleanup infrastructure. You can also, for example, um, uh, you can do passive sampling on riverbanks, for example, or on existing hydraulic infrastructure like dams or sluices, et cetera. Um, and it can actually help to get a first order estimation of how much plastics or what kind of plastics are in uh, the river system that you're interested in. 
And finally, there's the, the so-called visual observations, which, uh, which is also a quite simple method uh, proposed by Gonzalo Fernandez et al., where, which is nothing more than asking people to stand on bridges and literally count all the pieces of plastic that they see floating by in a specific amount of time. And although it's very simple, this method very well sort of allows you to compare um, plastic transport over time, but also between rivers. Uh, which I think uh, it's quite nice. Um, what we did is sort of thought we, we were we were thinking that all these all of these methods are quite nice, but as you can already see, they're quite different, and it makes it difficult to compare results obtained with these different methods, right? So what we propose is a new method where we start simple, and depending on the available um, uh, capacity and time you can add or extend your measurement campaign with new information that uh, maybe sheds uh, more light on what's going on. So the method that we have been using for the last couple of years um, uses or starts with the visual observations. And we say, well, if you, have a, if you, have a, if you measure plastic uh, transport in a specific cross section, you already get an idea of how much plastic is traveling in this river and how it's distributed over the cross section. And secondly, if you have time and, and money, you can invest in taking some samples actively or passively to get so-called plastic statistics, uh, which allows you to, um, to calculate mass transport. So you, you can turn your, uh, your flux in terms of items per unit of time into mass transport in kilograms or tons uh, per unit of time. And thirdly, you can find relations with hydrology. So is concentration increasing or decreasing in your river system? And if you have that, you can do extrapolation to arrive at uh, an estimation, um, taking, to, taking into account time and space. Especially nice thing is that this sort of scheme and this, uh, I would say, first effort to really have harmonized uh, measurement methods also allows for, uh, for new measurement methods that might uh, make especially the first step a lot easier. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but five minutes. Okay, then I'll just give some examples now of results that we obtained in various rivers and uh, present the outlook on what I think that we should be doing next. So how does it look like in, uh, in reality? Uh, this is an example of, uh, of one of my favorite rivers, uh, the Saigon River in Vietnam, uh, flows through the, the large city of Ho Chi Minh City. And this is one of the first rivers where we tried our, our new measurement protocol. And what you see here is a, a typical cross-section of the river. And on the right, you see a typical result of the measurements, um, how we did it. So on the, on the, on the x-axis, you see the river width. On the y-axis, you see the, the, the plastic flux in terms of plastic pieces per minute. And uh, the colors represent different hours of the day. And what you can already see here, that for this particular system, there's a very clear preferential flow site during some hours of the day. And after some hours, you see that the flow actually changes in opposite direction, and most of the plastic is being transported on the other side of the river. Uh, that is because of the, the location of this uh, specific measurement location. You already see the tidal influence, but this is exactly the information that we might, or that might be very valuable to, to optimize our uh, cleanup uh, strategies, for example. Well, secondly, the variation over space. So if you have measuring locations across or in uh, along a river, you can also look at the longitudinal variation, uh, which is what we did in the River Sena. So here on the x-axis, you see the distance from the river mouth, with zero being the estuary, and on the y-axis, again, the, the plastic transport. And what you see here is that during low discharge, there was, let's say, very few plastics in the river, luckily. But with increased discharge a couple of months later, you see that there is not only uh, a clear profile in the longitudinal direction, there's a factor of 10 between the most upstream um, measurement location and the most downstream measurement location, but you also see the influence of the seasonality here, where there's almost a, an order of magnitude increase in plastic transport um, close, closest to the river mouth. Now, again, back to the Saigon, um, we actually measure plastic pollution or plastic transport for almost a year. Um, and what you see here is the, the months of uh, the year 2018, the plastic transport on the y-axis. Um, and also here you see that there is almost a factor 10 between the, the minimum and the maximum plastic transport throughout the year. So far, we've been mainly looking at specific cross sections, but we can also use these uh, techniques to, um, to, to explore plastic transport in a, in a more complex system. 
So the other flaw of, or let's say one of the challenges of modeling approaches is that you take a catchment lumped approach. And if you go to places like Jakarta, um, you see that these models don't make sense because a city like Jakarta has a, who has been to Jakarta? No one? One? Well, if there's one thing or that, uh, that I always tell about Jakarta, that it's, uh, let's say it's a hydraulic mess. There's many canals, there's many rivers, they're all connected. So um, if you want to assess plastic pollution in such a system, you have to choose your measurement locations wisely. But with these um, relatively simple measurement methods, we're actually able to, uh, to make a first estimation of how much plastic we believe is entering the ocean every year, which is uh, 2 million kilograms per year. It's quite a lot. What's that? In a single, yeah, in a single city. So imagine that this. Twenty percent of the global. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine, yeah. Um, and then finally, because uh, yeah, it's relatively easy to to measure. It also allows us to sort of allowed us to do a first um, global study uh, where we could easily compare the abundance of plastic pollution across different rivers, but also in time. And I think what's most striking here is that within the given or within the randomly selected rivers that we uh, that we measured we could already find an order of magnitude variation of five which i think is quite striking so not does this does this sort of give some first order estimation of specific rivers but it also shows um where we should maybe focus uh, most of our efforts on in terms of uh, reducing plastic pollution from rivers uh, finally, an outlook to the future, because one of the questions I always get is like, oh, can't you do this in a smarter way instead of uh, asking people to stand on bridges all the time? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, we can. And there is various, various ways that we're trying to do that. Um, the first thing is using the power of citizen science. So there's uh, the, the Crowdwater app um, developed by University of Zurich, uh, by Jan Seibert and his colleagues. Um, that I really recommend you to download and start using if you go to rivers, uh, because you can me measure water, le water level, soil moisture, et cetera. And since recently, you can also measure plastic pollution in river <laughs> systems. Um, and just to illustrate, this is an example from uh, the beautiful city of Delft, where I lived a very large uh, part of my life. Uh, these are the, the measurements that I did on my uh, weekend days. And you, you see that even in these, uh, in these systems, there is a quite some plastic pollution on a random time of uh, on a random moment in time but there's also quite some variation again over time now, of course I was in Oslo or I arrived yesterday in Oslo already so I took the opportunity to go to the to the Akers Elva <laughs> close to uh, to the Mathallen and um, also here you can use this app because what did I see yesterday I saw one of them I said I saw one of these electric mopeds or electric scooters yeah. <laughs> on the river bank or on the river bed. Uh, I'm not sure if I should count this as plastic because I think this is mainly uh, other materials. Uh, but it also shows that even here, the rivers are quite polluted. And just to illustrate that, um, on the river banks at the measurement location where I went yesterday, there are already three and two of them quite large uh, plastic debris items that I uh, identified and measured here. Um, so I think next time when you go to, uh, to the Mathallen, uh, please take a couple of minutes to uh, do some measurements for us because they're very valuable. Finally, and this is, I think, uh, yeah, something that uh, that has been proposed for quite some time now, is the use of drones, right? So, most, as you already, as you, as you might have seen, most of the measurement um, methods that we use so far, they rely on bridges, they rely on infrastructure. Well, what about all these places where you have no safe bridges to measure? And what about all these places, um, for example, in estuaries, where you have very wide sections that you still want to measure to make uh, to quantify how much plastic is, is actually being emitted into the oceans. I think there is a great future for use of drones. Uh, we did a, a sort of proof of concept study in Malaysia uh, half a year ago. Um, and I think what you can see here is very nicely on the y-axis again, the, uh, the hour of the day on the y-axis is the river width and the size of the bubble uh, demonstrates or shows how much plastic we observed uh, at that location. And you see that by just doing a couple of flights, uh, we were able to get an, an idea of the absolute uh, magnitude of plastic pollution, but also about the spatial and the temporal variation um, for the specific rivers. Now, for the future, I think there's four main topics that we should really invest our time and money in, uh, starting with the degradation and legacy of plastic pollution, especially sp uh, plastic debris. Um, a recent study by uh, Imogen Nepper and, and Thompson this year 
showed that these biodegradable plastic bags uh, basically didn't degrade at all after three years under marine and other environmental conditions. And they could still carry basically the same load as they did when they were uh, freshly made. So yeah, um, once in the environment, they are pretty durable. That's what they were designed for. Um, another anecdotal piece of evidence when we were doing measurements in the Sana, most of the plastics that we find on the riverbanks actually originate from the 70s. So that, that, that says that even, or that I guess that shows that even when we would stop all the plastic sources into the rivers, that there will still be decades and de decades that we will keep on finding all these gigantic pieces of plastic pollution uh, all around the world. That is exactly why we also need to invest more in better and more consistent and harmonized uh, monitoring methods. I think the drones are one example, but recent research also showed that uh, we could actually use spaceborne remote sensing to detect plastics, uh, not only in coastal zones, but maybe even in the more dynamic and more complex river systems. Uh, and by doing that, by collecting more data on more systems, we can also better understand the transport mechanisms. Um, luckily, there is now slowly uh, more data coming in uh, of not only plastic transport in rivers, but also hydrological information. So rainfall, runoff, wind, etc. And that will allow us to finally start exploring what drives plastic transport from the land into the rivers, but also in rivers towards the ocean. And then finally, um, the role of extreme events, I think, is incredibly underestimated because we can, uh, we can have perfect regulation and perfect waste infrastructure. So as an example, I would say either Norway or, for example, Japan. But if there's one thing that Japan is also famous for is, of course, the natural hazards tsunamis, earthquakes, um, floods, etc. And even then, this is, a, this is a, I think, a picture taken uh, in Japan after the 2011 uh, tsunami. You can see that you can have all the greatest infrastructure in the world, but one tsunami, one event, and your whole plastic city is into the ocean, or it's just being emitted into the ocean. Um, evidence of, um, of several observations on the American coastline actually demonstrated that there is an increase of uh, there's a, there's a, what is it, uh, 10 times as many plastic piece, pieces being found on the shorelines now in North America, and they can actually be contributed or attributed to the 2011 tsunami in Japan. So that shows how important these uh, events might be in the total emission of plastic uh, debris from land into the ocean. So concluding or summarizing, uh, we discussed if plastic is a problem. I think we can conclu conclude, yes, it is a big problem. Uh, we've talked about uh, the definition of plastic debris, uh, about the origin and fate of plastic debris, and also about uh, the gaps in our knowledge there. Uh, we talked about several ways of quantifying plastic debris, debris um, and also showing that there's still a lot of room for improvement there. And finally, we discussed some um, potential ways forward to uh, really uh, start understanding plastic debris in river systems and more importantly to make sure that we uh, get rid of it as soon as possible. Well, if you find this interesting, there's uh, luckily quite some uh, literature available now. Uh, and um, yeah, for, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, someone start. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. I was wondering when you're talking about drones, because we know that uh, it's not all plastic that floats. Yeah. It's probably different in the river system than in the ocean. But uh, have do you know if some anyone's tried with underwater drones in addition to normal drones? Yeah, I, that's a very good question. Uh, should I repeat the question, or do you think? Uh, Please. Yeah, so the question was, uh, what about uh, the non-floating plastics and uh, if there is any work done on underwater drones? I, I've in heard some rumors. River yeah, in river system. Yeah, yeah I heard some rumors. Uh, of course, it's also quite tangent because it's so dynamic. And uh, unfortunately, most of the rivers are also quite turbid. Mm -hmm. So a lot of visual methods don't really work. Um, but at this moment, um, a student is using or is trying to use acoustic measurement techniques to um, detect plastic debris uh, below the surface. So the suspended plastics. And yeah, just to quickly elaborate, um, yes, most of, the, most of the, the work that has been done so far is only on the floating part. And um, unfortunately, there's been very little data. There's very little data available on 
how much plastic is actually suspended and is in deeper layers. But I think that uh, in, in some river systems, this might be quite significant. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we don't really know how to measure that uh, accurately over time and space. So it, also that is a, a huge challenge for uh, the near future. Yeah. I have a question about uh, your methods. There has been uh, like a core assessment of uh, the uncertainty. So do you challenge your method and provide uh, an accuracy assessment. Yeah. So the question was if we uh, did some um, estimations of the uncertainty of our methods. Um, yes, partially yes. Uh, unfortunately, because there's no benchmark method, it's very difficult to compare it to the standard. So we have to do that ourselves. Um, and I guess that's that's always with the most challenging part. Also, I think it's quite exciting. Uh, but uh, yeah, how to do that if you don't have uh, a regulated or harmonized method that's available. Um, so just to give some examples, uh, what, for example, we did with the visual observation methods is very simply ask multiple people to do the same measurements at the same time and see if there is a bias in how much pieces they count or didn't count. Uh, based on that, we could sort of say that there's an, an, um, an, an average bias of about 10% for um what is it again for let's say plastic transport rates of um 50 pieces per hour or more yeah so of course we also notice that if there's really a lot of plastic in the river system so uh for example if you go to indonesia or the philippines in the philippines just to illustrate we found rivers where there's more than eighty thousand plastic items flowing into the ocean per hour so imagine counting that by hand. <laughs> you see that there's a limit, and um, and we are not really sure what this limit is. Uh, but we we did find that by comparing it, for example, to uh, camera Im imagery uh, taken by either, um, let's say, um, normal cameras that be mounted on bridges, or by comparing it to drone imagery, uh, we could see that on the image-based estimations, there is way more plastics that we detected because there's basically more time to see it. And there's more time to uh, to do a more accurate estimation. So partly, yes, we did some uncertainty estimations, but uh, we're we're not there yet. And there, this is definitely something that uh, needs more attention in the future. Yeah, another question: uh, You've been monitoring quite a large river. What is the human workforce you need to do the investment of time? Yeah. You talk about camera, putting camera in the bridges. Yeah. Frequently, you lose the camera because people steal it. Yeah, it's a, a very good question. So again, what's the, the what's the, the 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 workload that you need to do monitoring? Um, it depends very much on how much time is and, and space and, and and labor and money you have available. Um, I guess there is, I mean, there's quite some rivers, for example, in the Netherlands or also in other places where there's already very fancy camera equipment installed, for example, for navigation activity monitoring or for water level monitoring. Um, we could, ex we could extend the, the use of these cameras to, for example, uh, measure uh, plastic debris. If you talk about the simple method, so let's say asking people to stand on bridges, yeah, I mean, that depends on where you are. In, uh, in Vietnam, we were lucky that we, with the very limited, let's say, European budget, we could uh, employ a lot of people to stand on bridges and, and monitor for us. Um, and don't forget that, I'm not sure how, how things are done here in, uh, in, in Oslo, of course, but if you go to, for example, Sweden or the Netherlands, there is already so many people that are doing all kinds of measurements for to assess water quality and quantity. Uh, and if this is one of the measurements that they can also do, um, I think with a very limited additional budget, you can really start understanding uh, plastic debris abundance and transport in uh, in your own river of interest. In the yeah, plastic isn't something I've worked on. I do. Uh, invertebrate cake samples in rivers and when you're having to search through looking for invertebrates anyway it would be quite easy to look count number of pieces of plastic yeah. well. i guess some people are doing that but by combining the work it could save save time and resources yeah completely agree so the suggestion was that uh, i think you're talking about the kick and sweep method right uh, well, or just the have, kick you method you can do server samples which have you kick well you uh, you collect that floating, the things that you kick the sediment and the stuff, animals, yeah. debris floats out and you catch it in the net. Yeah. Uh, or you can do a timed kick, which is a little <coughs> less accurate in terms of how much river you cover. But 
Yeah, no, I can completely agree that by combining measurements that are already being done, uh, I mean, that's that's a definitely a, a way forward. Um, just quickly talking about drones, for example, there are so many, let's say, research institutes and governments interested in drones and using drones to assess basically everything. One of the things is plastic debris. Um, so there's interest. The difficult thing with drones is getting permits to do the measurements. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone here works with drones, um, but you also always have to do it, especially if you're not really sure what to do yet or how to do it. You have to do it sort of undercover. You have to tell them it's your hobby which sometimes it is, um, <laughs> but you cannot, yeah, you, you cannot just send uh, students to, uh, to a random place on the world and just tell them to tell the police that that's their hobby to fly drones, right? So it's, it's quite tricky sometimes to, uh, to see and to optimize these methods as well, based on many legal reasons, unfortunately. Any more questions? Uh, I, I'm also interested in drones, and I recently heard the news that uh, DJI, the drone company, recently developed an uh, infrared system that they can, um, that, like, that the drones can observe the objects with infrared spectra using that system. So it's yeah. quite <coughs> suitable for uh, environmental monitoring, and uh, and also I think uh, for uh, marine debris and. Yeah, but not microplastic because they are too tiny. And uh, I have another question: Is uh, what is the uh, sampling frequency for your rivers to make the global abundance comparison? Yeah, so two good uh, questions. First question was about the um, use of infrared uh, technology in drones. Um, there has been looked into. It's also quite tricky because some plastics you don't really see because they have they have the same temperature as the water. So if you look at the very thin foils. For example, you don't really observe them, but if you look at the larger pieces, um, there there are some measurements that very clearly demonstrate that you can use infrared or near infrared to very clearly, very easily, relatively easily detect plastics. So it's uh, quite nice that we can also start monitoring uh, during nighttime, because we just, we still don't know what happens at night, right? So. <laughs> uh, second question was about the sampling frequency. Um, so so far, sort of, that's just 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 a gut feeling. We try to do it with an hourly frequency. So all the measurements that we that we did for the uh, for the global study, or let's say the the intercontinental study, was all done with uh, hourly observations. And then, of course, yeah, some of them uh, were measured for a couple of days, some of them for for many months, etc. At least we used the sort of hourly uh, sampling frequency there. Or questions or uh, suggestions. I can use all the advice in the world, uh, yeah, so <laughs> please let me know. Um, yeah, if you feel free to connect uh, to me, this is my Twitter account. Uh, also, feel free to add me on LinkedIn or whatever. And then, if you have ideas or if you want to work on plastics here or somewhere else, please let me know. Uh, always happy to collaborate. And thank you for uh, being here. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.